Welcome everyone to tonight's online community forum. My name is Pamela Duncan, or Pam, and I am the President and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. I am joined today by my good friend and dear colleague, Amanda Westbrook. We are still partnering with the Tacoma Urban League for this series of conversations. Our uh, colleague, Twina Nobles, is on a break during the month of October during the campaign season. Amanda is serving as our moderator for this conversation. Amanda. Thank you, Pam. Tonight's conversation is, can you believe it, our 22nd in this wow. series of discussions where we are diving into the different ways that COVID-19 is impacting Tacoma and Pierce County. Tonight, we are hosting a special candidate forum for two candidates vying for the Congressional 10th District, which extends from parts of Tacoma south to the Olympia area. Tonight, we will start our meeting with former Mayor Marilyn Strickland and Representative Beth Dolio will join us at that 5.30 mark. Marilyn, thank you so much for setting aside time to be with us for this uh, half hour. Well, thank you very much to MDC, to the Metropolitan Development Council and the Tacoma Urban League for hosting this. I'm honored to be here tonight. And we will be here for the community throughout the COVID-19 crisis and beyond with new conversations with a purpose every Monday evening at 5 p.m. The most important message throughout the series of conversations is that there is hope for our community. Our focus is to create space in each meeting to talk about resources, things that we all can be doing to help get us through this pandemic, and to hear from others and the work that they are doing. Pam, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We want to gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lashutid Seed language. And of course, today is October 12th, and we proudly celebrate National Indigenous Day. Throughout today's conversation, you can submit your questions to be addressed by our speakers or our speakers using the question and answer function in Zoom. And as always, we cannot promise that we will have time for every question, but we will make our best effort to get through the list in our allotted time. Okay, let's get started because time is valuable. I, to get started tonight, I want to check in with you, uh, Marilyn Strickland, and also with Pam to see how we are holding up today. How is your heart doing? And I'm gonna have uh, Marilyn, you go first, please. All right, well, you know, thank you for that question because, you know, as we are social creatures and we typically interact with each other, with each other whether we call on the phone or on Zoom, we say, hey, how are you? And the default answer is, oh, I'm fine. And what I'm finding now during COVID, because remember, this has been going on for basically most of the year, and people are being very authentic in their answers. And they're saying, oh, I'm okay, or eh, or sometimes they're saying I'm good because I'm entirely grateful for what I have in my life. And so for me, it's like, you know what? I'm actually doing okay. And I say okay because as you know, it has been a trying year for all of us. There's a lot of uncertainty and we never imagined that in October of 2020, we would be in the middle of a pandemic, which looks like, the rate of infection is increasing again. But there's a lot to be thankful for. And so I say, I'm, I'm doing okay. But I worry about my elders. I worry about my husband, who's a high school principal, and how they're going to get students back in school. Because for a lot of students who miss school, that's often the best part of their day. And they're missing out on the social emotional benefit of being around other people and having structure. But overall, we're okay. So thank you for asking. Well, thank you for being so transparent. 
Pam, how is your heart today and how are you doing? I am well. I am encouraged by the different spaces I find myself in with my colleagues and that honestly, honestly, we hold one another up and we have so much hope for how we can make our community better. And I stand with, um, I stand in um, camaraderie and um, pride for my indigenous brothers and sisters in recognizing this day as um, important to them and every day. Thank you, Pam. So beautifully said. Marilyn, um, let's start with you introducing yourself in the sense of why um, are you running for office and what platform you hope to push if you are elected? Great. So you know, for those of you who know me as the former mayor of Tacoma or even as the CEO of the Seattle Metro Chamber, there's a public persona that you have. But some of you may not know my personal family story. And I want to share that with you very briefly because so much of that informs who you are and why you do what you do. So my family story starts in Noonan, Georgia, a rural town where my father, a young black man, joined a segregated army. And he fought in two wars and fought for and loved a country that did not always love him back. When he was stationed in Korea, he met my mother in Min Kim. And for those of you who don't know, that means I'm black and Korean. And they fell in love and got married and I was born. And my family moved to the United States together as one unit in the 60s in Virginia when it was illegal for them to be married to each other. And my mother tells the story of my father wearing his army uniform and them driving around all night long with their one and a half year old baby trying to find a motel room and no one would rent to them. And I tell the story because it gives you context to remember that in my lifetime, not that long ago, this country had laws on the books that are very different than what they are today. So as I think about why we're here in Tacoma, my father was at Fort Lewis, which a lot of families use as a way to get to, to here, especially if you're part of the African-American community. And I think about the fact that we had food on the table, a roof over our head, access to good health care through Madigan Army Medical Center, and the comfort of knowing that my dad served his country for 20 years and that my parents could retire relatively comfortably. That's not true today for too many people. Some people get none of that. Some people get pieces of it. And that's why I'm running for office. I also run for office because I know that I come from a legacy of people who've had to fight, struggle, and endure discrimination and hardship that I cannot imagine. I run for office because I have a duty to the people who came before me to step forward because they have blazed trails for me and created paths that make it possible for someone like me to even run for office. And I run for office because the South Sound is growing. It is becoming desirable. People are discovering it and we wanna make sure that this growth is equitable that it's inclusive, and that it doesn't leave people behind. Because as we've seen this region change, we know that there are some big challenges that existed even prior to COVID. So I'll go deeper into some of those issues, but that's my why. Mm. Thank you for that. You, you touched my military brat heart on that one. Right? <laughs> yeah. So speaking of those issues, the next question is, what do you see, Marilyn, as the biggest issues for constituents right now in the 10th con Congressional District? You know, I would say, Amanda, that the issues facing people in the 10th are not different than what we're facing across the country. As I mentioned earlier, you know, back in December and January when I was first declared I was running for office, we didn't think we'd be in the middle of a pandemic. And so first and foremost, we have to get this pandemic under control. And I say that because kids are not in school people are losing their jobs, businesses are closing, people aren't traveling, and that is having a profound impact on our society and who we are. So I'd say getting the pandemic under control has to be the top priority of what we do. And by handling that, we will touch areas like healthcare, like education, like housing. 
I'd say the other part that's important too with the COVID issue is that we have to find a way to get relief into people's hands. And blunt, putting that bluntly, Amanda, it's getting cash into people's hands. We need unemployment benefits to be extended. We need them to be at a rate that will help people stay stable. We need to make sure that the small businesses who desperately need help to stay open, and I say small businesses, I mean nonprofit social service agencies, I mean arts organizations, I mean employers. And we have to make sure that those funds get into the organizations that need them so that we can stabilize everyone in their economy. And then finally, I will just talk about the issue around social justice and racial justice. You know, COVID has amplified the inequities in our society. And we know that policing is top of mind for a lot of people, despite the fact that America has a short attention span, but it has not gone away. It's been there for a long time, and we need to find a way to address it at the local, state, and federal level. Mm. It's if you're reading my mind, because the next question I have for you is, can you offer your statement about equity and social justice, and can you expand more on what is behind that statement? So I don't know if I have a prepared statement, but I'm going to get a little philosophical here about it. So, you know, equity and social justice, I think, for so long have been considered what I call boutique items, right? They're items for those people or a small fraction of the population. And now you're starting to hear those terms more mainstreamed. And I say that because you hear the terms DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you hear that from organizations of all sizes all over the place. The challenge is that we talk a good game about DEI, but when it comes to practicing it, we still fall short woefully so. And so as I think about equity inclusion, it has to be the act of accepting and asking ourselves, what are we going to do to address some of these imbalances and inequities? And that's everything from education, right? Access to high-speed broadband has been an issue that has been amplified because of COVID, because a lot of families simply don't have it. So they can't participate in online learning. And we know, ma'am, that for example, that in the 21st century, having access to high-speed internet is really the way you fully participate in society. It's how you can apply for a job. It's how you pay for bills. It's how you can register to vote. It's how you even get access to telemedicine if you live in a rural area without a big hospital. And so that's something that is really important. The other thing I think about with equity is just acknowledging that when we address inequities, when we're able to say comfortably that racial equity is an issue, that benefits all of us. I'm gonna repeat that. Equity and inclusion are not things, and social justice are not boutique items. If we address those things, every single member of the society benefits from it. So that's my kind of hybrid philosophical statement about it. We talk a good game, we need to do better, and everyone needs to be held accountable. And as I've talked to people throughout the course of this campaign, especially some folks in DC, I've been very open about saying that if I look at policymaking at the federal level, I will do it through the lens of equity and ask myself, is it going to help or hurt marginalized communities? Is it going to help or hurt people of color? Is it going to help or hurt people who are underrepresented? If we can address, some, if we can address inequity that way, it benefits the entire society and this entire nation. I love that. 30,000 feet looking down view you just gave us of your definition of equity. You have quite the legacy here in Tacoma. And if that was enough, it would be enough. But what legacy do you hope to leave after your first term in office? You know, I would say a few things. Number one, I want to be an example that you can run a political campaign with a positive message and talk about your accomplishments, your vision, and what you hope to do. So that when you get to Congress and you are there after one term or two years, you're able to really focus on the vision of what you want to accomplish. And I say that because you want to come into a place with your reputation entering the room before you do. You want people to understand that you're there to get things done, that you are there to work with all people, that you are there to have an open mind and to listen, even with people who disagree with you. Because if we're going to move this country forward and address these profound issues like COVID, 
like housing, like inequity, like bringing our economy back and addressing racial justice, we have to make an attempt to work with all people. And I take pride in the fact that I'm able to bring people together to solve problems. So my legacy is I ran a clean campaign that was a positive message about my accomplishments and what I wanted to do. When I got to Congress, I was successful because that was a springboard that allowed me to bring people together to get things done and deliver for my district. Oh, beautifully said. So in terms of the ongoing impacts of COVID-19, former Mayor Strickland, how do you propose working with those colleagues in Congress to create conditions that are more equitable for economic recovery? Because we have never been more divided in this country than we are right now. Yeah, you know, I will tell you that, you know, I am fortunate that I have 24 sitting members of Congress who have endorsed my campaign. And I don't say that because I'm bragging about my endorsements, which I am, it's okay. But it shows that I have people who are very progressive, people who are liberal, people who are moderate. And I think that bodes well for who I can attract and the faith that people have in me as a leader. And, you know, I'm proud to have three members of our Washington State delegation supporting me. But you think about the difficulty and the heavy lift of trying to agree on policy. And we often talk about, are you going to be able to reach across the aisle? Sometimes it's just getting agreement under your own tent. <laughs> so you have to have the ability to figure out what our agenda is as a party and then think about what it's going to take to bring other people along. Now, of course, you know, you can pass policies when you hold the majority, but you know, ideally you want some other people to support it too. And I say this, you know, when we talk about people being afraid for their lives and livelihoods, who gets affected by COVID, who comes down with it, and tragically who dies from it, that is a nonpartisan issue. When people are losing their jobs, when people's businesses are going out of business, when we see people who are tragically in desperate need of wraparound services and social services, that, that, that affects people from all walks of life. And so it may be very hopeful of me, but I do believe that those, if those problems affect everyone, then every member of Congress should say, I have a job to do, and it's to help the people I represent, whether your state is red or blue. And so again, I'm not delusional about going in there and just telling everyone what to do, but I just think that as this progresses, and let's talk about next January, for example, this nation is going to need leadership desperately. And I just am hopeful that we're gonna find a way to come together and just do the things that people expect us to do. So you have a beautiful vision for what your legacy will be after your first year. As you work your way back, Marilyn, what do you hope to achieve in that first 90 days and then 180 days? Because you're walking into a house that is a house of cards right now. So, you know, well, you know, I've, I've already had conversations with people and this is not like, you know, pe people ask you a lot of questions and they start to ask you which committees you want to serve on. What do you want to do? And, you know, your first your first few months in Congress is just a scramble to get everything up and running to basically set up your office. But with that said, I mean, I hope that I will have some strong allies. You know, I'm part of a group called the New Democrats who've endorsed me, the New Dems. And this is the largest caucus in the House. And it's basically people who are dedicated to getting things done. And so I would say that the first thing we want to do is we have to get this COVID under control. And I will keep coming back to that ad nauseum, but this is really what's keeping us from doing the things we need to do as a nation. And so I'd say the first 90 days is getting in there, working with what I hope will be a new administration and supporting them in their work to get COVID under control, to have a national strategy, to provide relief to people because we will need another round of relief funding, even if they pass something this year and being very intentional and targeted with that money. I think that's gonna be a little different. Every time there's a successive relief package, there's a chance to calibrate it and be more sharp and more intentional about how it happens. And so by the time there will be a third relief package, I'm hopeful that we can learn from what we could have done in the first two and think about being intentional about it. So COVID, more relief, Let's just stabilize. Let's just get everything stable. That's what I'm thinking of. So Marilyn, when you think about that intentionality that you're talking about, and you're talking about being COVID under control, and you're talking about uh, more relief packages, how does that funnel in to ensuring that people can stay in their homes during this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, 
the House of Democrats passed a package back in May, and then it just went to a graveyard. And it was trillions of dollars to provide relief to our first responders, to families, to cities and states. And I'm going to talk about why this is important because I come from local government. And I do believe that providing direct relief to cities should be part of the next package. And I say this because no one knows better than a city what their specific needs are. And every city is a little different. And so as I think about, for example, the work that you all do at MDC or even the work that the Urban League does, you know that there are very specific needs in your communities, whether it is going to be something related to social services, some emergency housing. And so as far as keeping people housed, the easiest way to do that is to get cash in people's hands. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. It's not, it's not that complicated. And it's one of the reasons that I actually am supporting the universal basic income pilot programs. There are 25 mayors around the country who are coming up with experiments to say, what if we just gave 500 people $800 a month for the next six months? And let's just see what that does. What's really cool is that the Wall Street Journal today had a report about South Korea leading the way again, and they are doing a version of universal basic income, and the stories are just profound about how it's helped people. And so I think something like getting cash in people's hands, considering universal basic income, and thinking very creatively about what we're going to do to stabilize people. Because what you just asked me about, Amanda, is like, how are we helping people meet their basic needs? I'd say the other thing that's important too, though, you know, we often talk about um, the extension of the moratorium on evictions, which I think is important, but we have to look upstream and we have to say to ourselves, if a landlord wants their rent, it's because a lender wants their mortgage paid. And so as we talk about this, we have to look all the way upstream. What kind of help are we going to be able to give landlords? And does that mean we have to work with the lending community to find ways to help them provide relief to the people they owe money. And also reminding folks too that when we talk about landlords, it's not just people who own large apartment complexes. It could be an elderly couple that owns a duplex and this is their retirement income. It could be someone who owns a house that they rent. And so I think just being gracious and flexible and understanding that there's a whole continuum from someone who's securely housed to the landlord, to the person who holds the note on that property. And how do we work with everyone to make sure that there's a way that we can all do this together because it is in a bank's best interest for someone to stay housed. It is in a landlord's best interest for someone to stay, to stay housed. It is in our community's best interest to make sure that people stay housed. And that is the most efficient way to address the housing crisis as far as people becoming homeless. It's like, and sometimes it's just $5,000. It's, it's just not five, it's $500 or it could be a couple hundred bucks just to help someone stay secure. And so I'm hoping that if we look at HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department, which actually has oversight over a lot of housing, that we're going to be flexible with how we're able to fund things, look at how vouchers are distributed. And to be honest with you, we should allow every person who qualifies for a voucher to get access to one. But that does nothing to add to the stock of housing. And so we have to add more housing, but also be more gracious about letting people have HUD vouchers if they qualify. Beautifully said. We want to say hello to Representative Beth Dolio, who just came on. And Beth, we are just finishing up with former Mayor Marilyn Strickland. So um, if you just sit tight, we'll be with you in just a moment. And it is really wonderful to see you. So Marilyn, other than the normal stress of a political campaign, which I don't know how you do it, <laughs> what is keeping you up at night? You know, I would say the thing that keeps you up at night is, you know, you think about the daunting challenge and the huge honor you would have to represent in Congress. And you, you want to be optimistic, yet you worry that the dysfunction is just going to keep you from being able to deliver. And so for me, I mean, I think about that, but at the same time, I feel hopeful. But sometimes just in the back of your mind, you think to yourself, are we going to be able to actually do something for the people in America and really help them have faith in the institution again, you know? I think about that. So when you're thinking about that, where are you finding hope amidst all of that? You know where I find hope? I have spent the last few months talking to a lot of people on Capitol Hill who are staffers, elected officials, and they wanna do the work. And I think sometimes we get a perception because it makes good headlines and it's clickbait, but there are smart, 
thoughtful people on Capitol Hill who want to do the right thing. And one thing I've learned is that, you know, if you're a member of Congress, you're only as good as the staff that you hire, who are going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And so it's just, it's hopeful when I think about who's actually on Capitol Hill. It's not the image that you get when you read the press, but there are some really smart, thoughtful people who care about equity, who care about inclusion, and who really want to take an interest in doing right, in doing right by people. So I think that's what gives me hope. Beautifully said, because as we know, to whom much is given, much is required. That's right. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, so much for your time. I know that you have a hard 5.30 stop. Thank you. Um, and um, Pam, is there anything on behalf of MDC and the Tacoma Urban League that you'd like to say to former Mayor Marilyn Strickland? Of course, first of all, thank you for making the time. Um, we respect that. And I also posted an article that is similar to what Mayor Strickland uh, referenced. And this is a, a research um, initiative that took place actually in Vancouver, Canada. So I, I posted that so people could take a look at that because it sounds like um, this is starting to get a lot of airtime. Mayor Strickland, former Mayor Strickland, um, I didn't I actually had no other questions. This was, you were so comprehensive in your responses. Usually I um, will send Amanda um, a chat and say, hey, I have a question I wanna ask, but I, I just wanna say thank you again for your time. Great, and thank you again for having me. So let's get COVID under control. Let's get cash in people's hands. Let's stabilize folks and meet their basic needs. And let's open our minds to universal basic income. Thanks for having me, I have to go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Love. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Nice Thank to see you all. Hello, Beth. Hello there. I, 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 again, as I told Marilyn, I'm stalking you. <laughs> 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 Beth, to start out with, um, I want to check in with you. And we do this um, every single time that we have this program every Monday at 5 o'clock. We want to check in um, and see how you are holding up today. And in the most basic sense, I want to find out how is your heart? Well, that is a really lovely question, and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I mean, my heart is, my heart is pretty heavy. Um, I think that what we are experiencing, whether it's the pandemic or the economic downturn, or a president who says he's not going to have a, you know, a shift, you know, a transition, a, a clear transition in power, or what's happening at the Supreme Court level. I mean, today, we started the hearings for the Supreme Court justice. Um, and then on top of that, I'm trying to run a campaign um, that it's very hard to run basically from my living room, right? And you know, part of what, what lifts me up is meeting with people in person. And, um, and I, you know, I have so little of that opportunity in this campaign. On the other hand, you know, I'm so thankful that I do have the opportunity to work from my home, that I'm not an essential worker that's putting my health on the line, that I have a roof over my head. I have, I have a lovely family, two lovely boys and a lovely husband that I've been with for many years. And I am so lucky to have all of those things in my life. And I know that so many people are struggling right now. So the heavy heart, the gratefulness, trying to find joy, my flowers from my garden that need to be <laughs> a little bit. But um, so I really appreciate you asking me that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. Um, and it gives me hope how much you do on behalf of people in Tacoma to lift up the African American community and other, um, you know, underserved communities. Um, I love what you're doing around education and home ownership, just great programs. And of course, I'm so excited about Tawana and her potential win in the state Senate. We really need her there. Well, we're not going to argue with you about that. <laughs> and I have to say that I feel um, as somebody who's lived in Tacoma almost all of her life that MDC 
and the Tacoma Urban League are the Rolls Royce of organizations. So I will throw my hat in the ring with the big kudos. Beth, I have followed you for quite some time, but I'm not going to assume that our audience members have. So would you start by introducing yourself and tell us why you're running for office and what platform you hope to push forward if you are reelected? Absolutely, thank you for the question. So I'm Representative Beth Dolio, and I am running to represent you in Congress. I've lived in this district for over two decades, and I've raised my family here. I currently represent the 22nd Legislative District, which is fully encompassed in the 10th, and it makes up about 25% of the district. Just a couple of things in my career. I have fought for women's reproductive freedom as an organizer at NARAL. And for the last 13 years, I've worked on climate justice at a regional organization called Climate Solutions that's really focused on building out our clean energy economy. And for four of those same years, I have served as a state legislator and had the honor to do that. And you know, as a state legislator, I've really been able to bring in significant state resources into our communities building jobs. So you think about clean energy, you know, I secured over $200 million for clean energy jobs creation in our communities. I passed a bill that, uh, well, I was front and center in getting the 100% clean electricity bill across the finish line, making sure it engages equity and also labor standards. Having that table set was really essential to getting that bill pushed forward. And then I did prime sponsor a bill that creates an efficiency performance standard for existing commercial buildings. So that means we're going to be sending workers into those buildings to do those retrofits to meet that standard. And the state budget has $75 million attached to it to help people get be put to work to do that. I passed legislation that provided access to over $1.5 billion for local governments to put towards housing and mental health. And I'm excited to say that King County is the first out of the gates to actually put forward a budget that includes that mechanism that I passed in the legislature and, in, and the budget has $400 million in it that will provide housing for 2,000 of our homeless, our chronically homeless neighbors and also provide mental health. Also central to getting several million dollars for the Arlington Drive Youth Campus and monies to help relieve congestion on I-5. So, you know, I don't back down from fights. In fact, my very first bill and the very first bill of the session in 2017 was House Bill 1000. I worked with the Black Alliance of Thurston County. It addressed that absurd malice standard on police accountability. And it was one of the steps in the past path to putting I-940 on the ballot. So that's a little bit about my background. I am running on a very progressive platform. I believe we need universal health care, And the only way to do that is to, to have Medicare for all, no other plan, um, eliminates private insurance and the profits in our health care and really make sure that every single person in our country, regardless of their income or their citizenship status, is, has health care. I've also been a strong voice and will continue to push for a national increase in the minimum wage to $15 and put in place permanent paid and family leave program like we've done here in Washington. And on climate, I believe that we need an intersectional plan that lifts people out of poverty provides all kinds of good family wage jobs and, and really puts people who are on the front lines, puts them squarely in the place to get the jobs, to get the education as we build out our clean energy future. And finally, I'm calling out income inequality. We need to squarely take that issue on. 80% of our families only have 7% of the, the country's wealth. And we need to change that because the 1% who have the 40% of the wealth, you know, there's a lot of wealth there and there's a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck. And I wanna see people thrive, not just survive. That's who I am and who I've always been, what I've always stood for, and that's why I'm running. Beautifully said, beautifully said. You know, uh, we're, we are just over here wishing that both of you could win. <laughs> um, and why the heck do we have to have such two powerhouses going against each other? That is just 
I'm only speaking as the moderator, not on behalf of MDC or Tacoma Urban League, but I think that that's just insanity. When I listen to the two of you and I go, oh, come on. So, <laughs> you know, I just want to say, I just put another congressional district next when we redistrict. Who knows? I well, don't think that's coming, but. Let me know what I can do to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that district, what do you see as the biggest issues for those constituents right now in that district? Well, Amanda, right now our small businesses and working families are just struggling. Yeah. And, and the federal government has a very significant role in ensuring that we put our economy back together. And most importantly, we have to start with getting our hands around the human impacts of this pandemic. You know, it, it requires that every person has access to healthcare. Again, I go back to making sure that whatever package we have, we're taking care of people's health. There's 87 million people who are now un or underinsured. And I think a package that we put together really should cover all out-of-pocket costs for those with public or private insurance for as long as this pandemic continues. And we absolutely need adequate resources going out to our states and counties and, and, ho and hospitals and manufacturers to make sure we have adequate levels of PPE, that we have rapid testing so people know right away and can quarantine, that we have the resources to contract trace, to contact trace. And then of course we need a vaccination plan that is just implemented as soon as it's available, it needs to we need to ramp it up and get it out and, and, and have people vaccinated. Because we can't recover until people feel that, you know, feel safe resuming activities that stimulate the economy. Now, after we have that under control, this is where the hope comes in, right? And this is where I think the other pressing issues in our district, you know, like transportation, like climate change, like housing, we have opportunities to really address those. And this is where my hope comes. We need a recovery package that puts people back to work, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, building out our clean energy economy, building affordable housing, and making sure that every person in this country has access to broadband. Those are some of the things that I, am, that I will be working on and pushing for. Beth, let's, uh, let's dive into your statement about equity and social justice um, in the sense of, what is your journey and what is what is your statement about that, especially during this time in our country? You know, my journey starts when I was um, when I was a little I was in middle school, actually. Um, oh, boy. I hope I, anyway, I hope I can tell this story. So um, I was actually um, my we moved to um, uh, a community in Illinois, and there were three towns that, um, I wasn't really gonna tell this story, but I'm going to because you asked my journey. Um, and, you know, basically we were redlined. We ended up in a community that was all white um, and it bordered a community that was very diverse um, and was about 40% African-American. And eventually when I, when I was in fourth or fifth grade, my, um, my, my, my dad got a job um, as a superintendent in the district um, in the uh, more diverse community, Kankakee, Illinois. And um, I started going to school there, but I was still living in this town because we hadn't found a house. And I had a birthday party. Um, and I invited um, a friend of mine from my new school who was African-American. And Maxine Badley was her name. And um, <clears throat> I had a friend that was... Um, that I'd also invited a, a, a white friend that I had had for a long time. And um, she actually couldn't stay at my house um, because of that. And it was the first time that I really had a, a, a sense of what, what racism was. Um, and so that has really impacted me through the rest of my life. You know, racial inequality and injustice is a systemic problem that is based on over 400 years of oppression. And it's no mistake that those in privilege and those who have privilege stay in power. They design policies, Jim Crow, the drug laws. That was all intentional for people in power to stay in power. And it is well past time for change. 
power is never handed over or we would have solved this issue. People would be, say, yes, it has to be fought for. And fighting for equity has really driven my work from that very moment when I realized what racism was and how it impacted my community in that you know, little way. Of course, I had no idea what the full ramifications were, and I still don't. Um, but I have advocated for the last 30 years and, you know, for justice, and it is core to my vision as a policymaker. I mentioned my first bill in Olympia was critical legislation that helped move 940, you know, onto the ballot and be successful. I was also a super strong supporter of I-1000. I joined a group of House members on the floor successfully pushing House leadership to bring that initiative to the floor for a vote. I prime sponsored a bill that would require implicit bias training for all public school personnel. And I've also fought for protections for our LGBTQ neighbors. I've partnered with our tribal neighbors. I've strengthened tenants' rights, and I've really fought hard for deep investments in housing. But so much more to be done. And you know, it's part of the reason I'm running for Congress. I, I am fighting for equity and justice, and I'm proud to you know do that work with endorsements from Representative Pramila Jayapal and Representative Ro Khanna. You know, clear leaders on equity and justice uh, in our congressional delegation. I also have the endorsement of Equal Rights Washington and the bulk of labor unions who are fighting to lift up working people. You know, no one person can be as diverse as the, the, the district that they represent. I can't share the experience and perspectives of everyone, but I can make sure that those experiences and perspectives are reflected in everything I do by reaching out having conversations, making sure that the right people are at the table. And as I have throughout my career, I will bring everyone to the table. I, will, I have started a racial justice policy team that will guide me through my work and, and as, a, as a member of Congress and make sure that those perspectives have, are part of what I'm doing, that I'm working through a racial justice lens on policy. I will be a Congress member for every neighbor in this 10th district. Beth, we have a question from our audience, and this is an anonymous question, and I'm going to read it exactly as it was put out, and here it is. We know that some of Mayor Strickland's most controversial things she did were signing on to the LNG at Port of Tacoma, the Stingray surveillance, and fighting against affordable housing tax during her time with the Seattle Chamber. What would you say are three of the most questionable things throughout your career that people would say you and say about you and what you did to learn from those? Um, well, I think, you know, I voted for the public records bill in the legislature and I, um, if I could reverse that vote in a second, I would do it. It was, um, the the wrong vote to take. Um, I feel like our leadership misled us and I didn't do my homework uh, well enough to um, to understand, you know, from my perspective, it was actually providing more information because it did, you know, it did require us to provide more than we were um, doing. And, um, you know, I learned from that. First of all, I learned you absolutely have to know, you have to know when a process is so condensed that something's up, something's not quite right. And you have to question that and you have to be really very clear about, um, about why that's happening and what may be wrong. So, and I take full responsibility and I would, if I could change that vote, I would do that. Um, I, let's see, um, two other things that I have done that really puts me on the spot. Um, Trying to think of things I did as a legislator that I was that I if I could go back and redo them that I would. Um, you know, I will say this: I took corporate PAC money as a state legislator, and I I I believe that corporations just have way too much power. I didn't take a lot of corporate PAC money because it you know I'm not you know I stand up to corporations and you know I you know it's not that I don't welcome them into my office and have conversations about important policy issues and try and find a common path forward. Um, 
But um, I did return quite a bit of uh, corporate PAC money. And I also was able to, um, because I am in a safe legislative district seat, surplus that to other legislators. So I, I actually didn't use any of that money to promote my own campaign. I used that for other people. And I felt like it was important to help people build our caucus so that we could pass policies um, that, uh, you know, protect working people, protect our planet. Um, but I wouldn't do that again. If I run for state legislature again, I certainly won't um, take corporate PAC dollars again. So that is a second thing. Um, and let's see, the third thing is that I don't spend enough time with my children. <laughs> and if I could rectify that, I work way too hard. I work too much. I'm not always present when my family is here. Um, and I wish that I um, could put my phone in a microwave and turn it on and blow it up and be totally with my family for as often as possible. You know, that would make a really great commercial. <laughs> <laughs> you could fundraise. People could get, you know, who wants to put, you know, best cell phone into the microwave? <laughs> I want to thank you so much for that answer it was just so transparent and it was so girl next door so thank you for that it's like you were talking to your girlfriends about three mistakes you made last <laughs> week and i enjoy that authenticity um i want to talk with you about what do you hope to achieve in your first 90 days and then the next 180 days in office given that we've never been more divided than we are right now in this country well, having been part of the legislature, it's super difficult to get anything done in, you know, in those hundred days. I mean, uh, but I think we need to press as hard as we can. Our window may be very short when we have control of the presidency and the Senate, just like it was in 2008. So we really need to push hard to pass as much legislation to lift people up, to protect our planet, and to move this country in the right direction around racial equity, around immigration reform and criminal justice reform. There's so much to do. But the first order of business is, of course, the recovery package, one that addresses, as I said, both the health and economic impl implications of the pandemic. But you know, there is this thing, we really need to restore Americans' trust in government. Um, we need to pass HR1. That was the number one priority of the current House of Representatives. And I think it's really, really important because people don't feel like their vote is secure, they recognize that gerrymandering is a problem. They recognize the impact of, you know, and the influence of corporate money. And, you know, I, I think we need to address that through the comprehensive package that is HR1 and was the number one priority of the current House of Representatives. So the, that I think, you know, in addition, I've already mentioned, you know, we need a permanent paid and family sick leave program. We need to provide access to swelling numbers of people losing their insurance. And, and you know, we absolutely need to pass police accountability and police reform. I would certainly be supporting the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and want to do that as quickly as we possibly can in those first few days. So when we think about helping people, um, you know, home is where the heart is. So what would you propose to help people stay in their homes and navigate through this pandemic? Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, we need to make sure that people, um, both renters and landlords, have cash <laughs> um, to really deal with the, you know, with the, um, with the mounting debt that people are accruing around around rent and you know and and mortgages we absolutely need to keep an eviction moratorium in place because the last thing we need to do is exasperate our housing problem more than it is already exasperated um, by seeing so many people you know being moved out of their homes um, so so I, I mean, I think that it has to be that stimulus package. It's unconscionable that the Senate hasn't acted on the HEROES Act, which does provide you know, a considerable amount of assistance to people who find themselves um, in this situation. Um, so, you know, and, and then 
And then, you know, again, I, I want to go back to that recovery package where we're actually building new housing because there's no question that we have a lack of affordable housing and we absolutely have to deal with that. And I have a long term plan for leveraging federal government dollars to actually do their part in creating affordable housing. You know, you can you can check it out on my website. I really encourage you to go there and check out my web my um, housing plan. Uh, but it does contain specific equity goals and investments to sure, ensure that everyone has access to home ownership or that we really increase the ability. And I know that's a really important issue for um, the African American community. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I was a leader on housing in the legislature and I, can, I plan to continue to be one. Mm, thank you for this when I'm elected. Other than the normal stress of a political campaign and not spending enough time with your children, <laughs> what, what is keeping you up at nighttime? You know, um, I would say the election at the federal level in terms of Trump and whether or not there's going to be a transition, uh, a, a, a good, you know, a smooth transition of power if in fact Biden and Harris win, and I so hope they do. But, you know, I'm also like, really concerned about people who are losing their insurance, the small businesses. I mean, there are, there are, you know, owners of small businesses in my community that I just love and adore and have frequented and they have shut their doors forever. And I am so concerned about the people who are on the brink, you know, I mean, the restaurants in particular, they're at, you know, they've lost 75% down in terms of income in this community because people don't feel safe going out. You know, and then our homeless neighbors, I'm concerned that they're going to, you know, contract COVID and that there, you know, will be, a, you know, just a huge disaster around that and, um, and more and more people losing their homes due to evictions and inability to pay mortgages. So those things and my concern and worry about people definitely keep me up at night. Um, so, Yeah just my concern and wanting to get out in there and try and make a difference in people's lives and try and help put this country back together. We really need to get our hands around the healthcare system system and get a stimulus package moving um, to really, you know, make sure that people have the resources that they need to, to, to survive and to thrive. We had one of our audience members put your uh, housing plan in our chat, action our okay. Q and And I want to say thank you to whoever did that. So Beth, um, to be respectful of your time and it's getting close to dinner time. So I know that you have children you need to feed. Um, where- oh, I don't cook. <laughs> That's my husband cooks. <laughs> All right. Well, then you are definitely a woman who gets things done. <laughs> Let's talk about where you're finding hope right now so my hope is about november 3rd it is about taking this country back and it is about really you know the opportunity to um you know we're going to be starting from a very um you know base level of putting our country back together and i just feel like there are opportunities for the federal government to step in with a recovery package that makes our taxes our tax system more equitable that begins to address in income inequality, puts people back to work, building out our clean energy economy, fixing our crumbling infrastructure, building more affordable housing, and making sure that everyone has access to broadband. I am hopeful that we can do that. And I wanna to go to Congress and start making it happen. So I would be absolutely honored to earn your vote. And, um, and, and you know, I'm only as good as my constituents help me be. Um, you know, I, I, Marilyn mentioned the staff, but it is really the constituents because I don't, I don't know what your experiences are until they are shared with me and I can act on them. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to have this conversation. Well, Beth, we appreciate you making time to talk with us and your very, very busy schedule. And I uh, would like to turn this back over to our uh, CEO and president of MDC, Pam Duncan, uh, for some closing words or any questions or comments that you have for State Representative Beth Dolio. And what else? What do you always say? I always say, Pam, drive us home and tuck us in. Miss <laughs> Beth, it has 
been such a pleasure to hear from you, to have you here, and to learn about what is important to you. This was uh, very informative for me, and I'm sure it was for all of our um, listeners. I posted in the chat um, the links to both of our candidates' websites so that people can just click on those and learn more. Thank you so much again for your time. And the only thing that I have as I drive us home and tuck us in is please vote everyone. Please ensure that you are registered to vote, that your family members are registered to vote, that your neighbors are registered to vote, and the folks you work with are mm -hmm. registered to vote, and then exercise that right. All right. Thank All right. you, everyone, for joining us tonight for this edition of Straight Talk. We are glad you joined us. We appreciate all of our listeners. Thank you so much. And without any further ado, I just wish everyone a good night.